Hello my darling, this is a new books video and to me it's beautiful that you seem to like watching them almost as much as I enjoy doing them. So let's just get started. The first book I want to talk to you about broke my heart and I should have known because we're talking about Ishiguro. And this has never let me go. The movie is coming out really, really soon because I've just seen a trailer recently. So I'll just put a bubble somewhere the minute I find out the exact date. Anyway, uh, this was shortlisted in 2005 for the Booker Prize. The Booker Prize was won by Ishiguro himself in 89 for uh, The Remains of the Day. And the movie is directed by Mark Romanek. You might know him as the director of One Hour Photo and um, he's also a well-renowned director of music videos and the ones that I managed to remember are Scream by Janet and Michael Jackson and The Devil's Haircut by Beck. Okay, so this story, again, is heartbreaking. Uh, it's a story about memories and what do they do to you, whether they help you throughout life or if they're just there in, hidden in your head to haunt you. As usual with him, it's a story about missing chances. And once you realize it, it's normally too late. It's a very romantic and melancholic tale. It's beautifully told. I definitely suggest this one. Two warnings though. If you're already sad because maybe, I don't know, it's a cloudy moment of your life, and it will completely absorb you. So if you have to study for an exam or something like that, wait do the exam and then read this book. I don't know why I haven't spoken about this one before. This is The Wasteland by Thomas Stearns Elliot. You know I'm obsessed uh, with just not staying with the initial and go for the entire name. Anyway, it's THE Wasteland because the author himself politely insisted on the THE on a, in a letter to Ezra Pound. He was awarded the Order of Merit that was established in 1902 by Edward VII. And this poem is something that you can't miss. It's a 434 lines modernist poem. It's obscure, there's satire and prophecy in it. So many abrupt changes of speaker, of location, of time. It's very interesting, something that the author himself said to a friend once, talking about the elegy written in a church country yard. He said that if a contemporary poet, conscious of his limitations, as Gray evidently was, would concentrate all his gifts on one such poem, uh, he might achieve a similar success. Ezra Pound strongly revised this text, and now that both editions are available, it's beautiful the fact that you can actually compare them. And the original manuscript was much, much longer. So if you're interested in this, I suggest you read both versions. This is David Foster Wallace. Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, it came out in 1999. It's a um, collection of 23 short stories. Three of them are entitled Brief Interviews with um, Hideous Men. Um, it's presented as transcripts of interviews where the questions are omitted. It's full of dark, dry humour, of alienation and conventional sexuality. The characters are ironic and tragic at the same time. They're funny, obviously. It's a vision, a very evocative vision of today's maladjusted humanity. This is Mark Haddon, uh, A Spot of Bother, came out in 2006. It's the second adult novel from the author of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And exactly like The Curious Incident, this one uh, examines mental health issues from the perspective of the patient. In this one, we follow George Hole, who is a 57 years old hypochondriac. The great thing about this, and of The Curious Incident as well, so I guess this could be said of the writings of Mark Haddon in general, is that while reading it, um, you won't be sure whether you're supposed to laugh or to cry, which is, I guess, exactly the point, because you'll feel a bit deranged yourself. Ha! Huh. This is Jonathan Coe, What a Carve Up, came out in 1994. In the American edition, it's entitled The Winshow Family, What a Carve Up. The title actually comes from the movie the main character is obsessed about, What a Carve Up, 1961. Um, anyway, in this book, very shallow and greedy characters are used to criticise how change in the 80s, uh, especially in Britain, was about satisfying a 
few of the people while the rest were forgotten. Michael Owen is supposed to write a biography about the Winshaws, a right-wing upper-class British family who would do whatever it takes to make money. In the process of doing so, he gets to know a lot about them and finds himself entangled in deceit, greed and politics. There's so many narrative forms, the, the multiple, it's sort of metafiction. It's the age of Margaret Thatcher and the main themes are class subordination, exploitation of working classes, karma, social, political and economic changes, greed, again, corruption, the impact of the medias and of dreams, because Michael has three and they are quite a burden. There's one interesting, well, there's many interesting things to say about this book, but a few that I care mentioning. Uh, one, there's a character, um, and it's key for the reader to see this character as an investigator immediately. So, um, the author decides to describe this character's flat as decorated exactly like the one that's described in uh, Sherlock Holmes' The Sign of Four. There's also a singular, Mr. Owen, singular which strongly reminds you of elementary. There's also a reference to Agatha Christie's Poirot, which is a great connection to the next thing I want to talk to you about, and that's Sherlock Holmes. Now, I want to talk about Sherlock Holmes in general, and really, really briefly. Uh, this is a new edition that I purchased recently because I just like the, the editing, you know, and the fact that so many of the stories are together here. What is known as the canon is the, the whole lot of books where you can find Sherlock Holmes, and that would be four novels and 56 short stories. The impact that Sherlock Holmes has had on everybody's lives, it's unparalleled. He is in the Guinness World Record as the literary character that's been more often on the silver screen. And as far as funny trivia goes, um, Holmes 2 is the name of the informatic system that the UK police forces use in any kind of murder investigation. And obviously it's a backronym, it doesn't make any sense, oh, anyway, it doesn't make much sense. It's Home Office Large Major Inquiry System. Anyway, it spells home, so it's cool. And reassuring, I guess, for detectives the world over. Another funny thing is that the sentence, elementary dear Watson, my dear Watson elementary, is never actually uttered by Sherlock Holmes himself in the canon. The first one who uses it is my beloved Woodhouse, which I've mentioned so many times before that I'm not going to do that again. But anyway, that happens in 1915, which is kind of late if you think about it. You can find Elementary and My Dear Watson separately, but never technically the whole sentence. So many contemporary characters actually have references to Sherlock Holmes. Should suffice to you to think about uh, Gregory House, and he lives in apartment 221B. I find it so fascinating the fact that the world is right now populated by people that play the great game. What is known as the great game is technically just the uh, pretense of uh, treating Sherlock Holmes as... Um, a real man who actually existed. Even yourself, if you walk down Baker Street and you look like a local, most probably someone will stop you and ask you either where Sherlock Holmes lives or where he lived. In the foreword of this beautiful edition, there's a few funny trivia. It says that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had begun receiving posts directed to Sherlock Holmes. One fan asked to be sent a copy of his monograph on tobacco ash. Other asked for his autograph. Some enclosed gifts for Holmes, obviously, including violin strings and shack tobacco. Another wrote applying for a job as his housekeeper. Consider also the great hiatus. This is what happens between 1891 and 1894. This length of time, theoretically, Sherlock Holmes is dead. Even though actually the adventure of Wisteria Lodge is set in 1892, so mm, it doesn't really make much sense. Probably the only reason why Sherlock Holmes came back to life was because the editor offered an absurd amount of money to the author for doing so. And probably the second Sherlock Holmes doesn't reach the heights of the first. But still, I find it beautiful um, reading the whole lot because it's such a unique character. You, you really can't miss it. The only flaw of reading Sherlock Holmes to me is that no matter what, I feel stupid whenever I read of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I feel small and slow. This one was a challenge to me and I have mixed feelings about it. 
is The History of Love by Nicole Krauss. Nicole Krauss is the wife of Jonathan Safran Foer, and you might remember him as the author of Everything is Illuminated and Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Now, Extremely Loud came out in 2005, exactly like this one. And the main thing that I want to discuss here is that, please, if you've read both, tell me if you've found, just as I did, many common features between this one and Extremely Loud. Anyway, it, this one is a homage to things lost and unsolved mysteries. There's a novel within a novel, and these, to me, are normally ingredients of success. It's full of references to Don Quixote, to James Joyce, to Franz Kafka, to Saint Exupéry, to Tolstoy and Neruda. Which is only logic, because it's a celebration of the power of writing and imagining things. I found this interesting, but not really great. Piece of advice, pay attention to photographs and their role of proof of life or presence, because to me, that is the main thing about this book. Next, I want to talk about two books from Graham Greene. He's another great love of mine. Um, this is The Heart of the Matter, came out in 1948, and A Source of Life. Uh, it's an autobiography, one of two. The second is Ways of Escape. Um, this one came out in 1971. What's amazing about these two books, especially if read one after the other, is that the main themes are the same, except this one is fictional and this one is autobiographical. Oopsie. They're both about Catholicism, moral change and pride. It's universally acknowledged that he suffered from bipolar disorder and this had a profound effect both on his writings and his personal life and you get a taste of both aspects of this with these two books. I gave another shot at David Sedaris after Squirrel 6 Chipmunk. This is Holidays on Ice. came out in 1997. It's a collection of essays about Christmas. Uh, some are new and some had been previously published. Um, again, as usual, it's always funny and compelling and so clever. What I wonder is, is David Sedaris as a man always so unsatisfied with everything? Because I mean, okay, it's comedy, so it's fun to complain about things, but all of them? I love Salman Rushdie, probably because he played along with Bridget Jones, mainly. But no, he's a great writer altogether. This is Luke and the Fire of Life, came out in 2010. It's a children's book, and it's the story of Rashid Khalifa, a legendary storyteller. He has fallen into a deep sleep and no one seems to be able to wake him. So his uh, son, Luca, uh, to keep him from slipping mm. away, decides to travel to the magic world to steal the ever-burning fire of life. And thus begins a quest with unlikely creatures and strange alliances, challenges, enchanted companions, and obviously perils. His language, it's beautiful. His stories are so colourful. Like those dreams when you get really, really lucky and you dream in Technicolors. Just like last time, talking about new classics, this is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, came out in 1960 to an instant success. It also won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a classic of modern American literature and it's loosely based on observations and a particular event that occurred in the author's hometown when she was 10 in 1936. She was also a close friend of Truman Capote's and Dill's character is modelled on him. There's warmth and humour, despite dealing with the serious issues of rape and racial inequality. Atticus Finch, who is the narrator's father, has become a moral hero. He's a model of integrity for lawyers. It's a southern gothic novel. There are themes of racial injustice and destruction of innocence. It's about courage, about human dignity, respect for others, compassion. I read this twice and each time it gives me the hope that I can be a better human being. And for this, to me, this book is priceless. I don't know much about science or physics for the matter. So many things that I see daily are like magic to me. <laughs> Probably gravity as well. It looks like magic to me. And I don't care to have it all explained. But this one tries. This is 13 things that don't make sense. And if you look at the world more or less the way I do, You'll be delighted to know that there's at least 13 things that scientists can't explain, no matter how hard they try, because, again, they don't make sense. The data come back and they're getting more and more precise by the hour, but they don't fit with the rules and the theories. 
this shows we still ignore so much about the universe we live in and also depicts scientists as human beings and I find this heartwarming. All right, by now everybody knows Federica loves zombies. Yes, I do. I like zombies. So when this came out, many darlings started asking me if I had already read it and I hadn't. Uh, it's Apocalypse Z. I read this in Italian and originally it's in Spanish. I bought this in December and since it's structured as a blog, because a blog started it all mainly, um, it has a starting date, which is the 30th of December. So I decided to read it uh, at the same pace. But after a while, um, the book was much slower than I wanted to be as a reader. I mean, it covers a span of nine months, so I just skipped ahead. Um, obviously, it's a story of a pandemic. And the most beautiful part of the book is the beginning, because when panic spreads, it starts like a landslide, extremely slowly. And at first, um, information and news about what's going on are rare, unprecise and vague. So it takes 69 pages to get to the sentence. Um, it's something like, uh, as unbelievable as it sounds, we're talking about Walking Dead. Then it probably blabbers a little too much. It's slightly too long. The whole story is told from the perspective of this lawyer, prematurely widowed, he's 30 years old, lives with his cat and he's obsessed with information, so he pays a lot of attention to both the web and uh, news forecasts, newspapers and the whole lot. And then he writes about it. So when you're told something that has happened, it's exactly like um, when a friend tells you something that's happened to him or her. And it's really, really evocative because you're not technically into the action the second it really unfolds. But you're the one that he goes to right after that, when he's still in shock and he wants to talk about it. As strange as it sounds, it's realistic. And there are two spoilers that I feel compelled to do. So if you don't want any spoilers about Apocalypse Z, put me on mute the second I switch to black and white, and when I'm back in colors, then you can listen to me again. So I'm going to black and white now. So first spoiler, this is one that I wish I had while reading this, so nothing happens to the cat. Phew. Second, the last line of the book might as well have been, editor, please cover me in money for the sequel. Okay, done. <laughs> Two teeny, teeny, tiny details. Last thing, this is a McSweeney's again, but I have to show you this. It's issue 36 and the theme is inside this head. So issue 36 is shaped like a head. This is what I called Think Outside the Box. <laughs> anyway, you open it, take off the cardboard. It says, to enhance the head sifting experience, please remove and discard this cardboard spacer. I'm not going to discard it, obviously. It has the signature chair. But once you have carefully removed it and placed it next to you, then you can actually rummage through thoughts. There's Michelle Chabon in this one as well. And you also find, uh, where is it? This is a tiny roll. And at first you think, Dave, filters, really? But then you come back to your senses, take the rubber band off. It's a long strip. And once you get to the beginning, it says, we are the official Max Sweeney's fortune tellers and our job here is relatively simple. We are in charge of knowing the fates of over 6 billion worldwide humans, including dogs, and we trust that with no real directions from us, our predictions will fall into the correct and deserving hands. Please clip and push these into the nearest cookie for best results. And obviously, the predictions go from Oliver Platt is your real dad, sorry for the late notice, to <laughs> you're pregnant. Or, what is good for one goose is good for another goose. Pure wisdom. And then you can spend the rest of your day trying to roll it up again. I mean, how can you not adore Max Sweeney's? Especially when they do things like this. It would take a genius similar to Dave Eggers to achieve 
something similar to that. But anyway, um, I'm doing my humble best with the Blue Poets Society. I'll put all the links in the bustle bar. Um, so far I want to show you the cards of the association. So far we have four subjects and I like them all actually. There, can you tell what they are? And as usual, I hope this wasn't much of a bore, that maybe it managed to be slightly interesting or entertaining. And I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye.